You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and I want to ask you, do you need an estate plan? Do you have an estate plan? You know, estate planning is a very important part of financial planning for many reasons. You've worked hard for your money. You want to see your children and grandchildren benefit You also want to see yourself taken care of when you cannot take care of yourself. So an estate plan also helps take care of you later in life. Your legacy is not just about increasing the financial wealth that you hope to pass on to future generations. It also involves preparing your family for the wealth they may receive and understanding what wealth means to individual family members and to the family as a whole and that wealth, it it signifies your life. So you want to pass on your values and your, you know, your, your life experiences and those kinds of things. Our guest today is Stephen Carpenter, a friend of the shows. He's a local attorney who specializes in estate and trust planning. He received his JD, his Doctor of Jurisprudence and Master of Law in Taxation from College of William and Mary. He has been in practice for over 30 years including wills, trusts, estate planning, and asset protection law. Hello, Stephen. Welcome back to More Living. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Talk a little bit before we get into the topic, Stephen, about what led you as you were pursuing law, what led you into having an emphasis in estate planning? Well, in law school, I took all these classes, you know, just about everything you can think of, and I just gravitated toward the taxes and the estate planning, um, partly because I felt like it was helping people and families rather than conflicts and, uh, you know, lawsuits. So I just enjoyed that type of, of law and I, I just had a proclivity to doing that. And although I practiced other things, um, as I could, I got down to just doing the estate planning and, and some small business law. So pretty early on, I mean, even in law school, you were gravitating that way. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, What would you say, especially to our younger folks who say, do I need an estate plan? Yes. uh, This is a good topic you picked for a good time of year because people are very much thinking about estate planning. Um, In fact, this is the perfect time to call a lawyer to make an appointment because in January, people will have new year's resolutions to make appointments and come in. Um, so, but yes, for a, for a young couple who's not sure that they do, we, do I even need to do estate planning? First of all, estate planning does not have to be complicated. It doesn't have to have a lot of, it, it usually does involve legal documents, but just whether someone needs an estate plan really depends on their individual circumstances and what their particular needs are. Um, especially if a young couple has children, they want to have somebody named as a guardian to raise that child if, if necessary, if, if something happens to them. So it's not just about their stuff. That's right. It's very much important about their passing on their values and passing, you know, choosing someone to raise their children if they have that age child. So, you know, and an estate plan is, is oftentimes a set of legal documents where you're setting out your wishes for what happens with your stuff. Um, and that's certainly important, how things are going to be managed and distributed after your passing um, or in the event of your incapacity, because that's another reason to have an estate plan. Because if, you know, if someone gets Alzheimer's or just, just even dementia, um, you need someone to take care of things while you're still alive. So I think when people hear the word estate plan, Stephen, I think people think 
about us about taxes mm-hmm. for some reason and wealthy, and, and wealthy people that's yeah. right and so um you know the reality is if you looked up at a pyramid that represented a state planning the tax piece is really just at the very very tip at the top right that's correct i mean there's so many other things that go into it with our estate tax exemptions a lot of folks aren't affect you know most folks are not affected but there are some but there are going to be changes to that in a cup in two years and we're going to get into that here in just a minute but mm-hmm. um i think if if i ask people do you do, or, or if i said to somebody do you think you need an estate plan a lot may say no but if i said do you need a will they would say yeah i really need a will yet that is part of an estate plan it is. so talk about the essential legal documents that start to form an estate plan okay so there are four essential documents that pretty much everyone should have um, so the first one would be a last will and testament um, where you specify who is going to administer your estate and handle things and sell your property. And then also you're outlining who gets everything. Um, and then the, the second thing that everyone should have is a financial power of attorney, where while you're alive, you've named someone that if you are unable to act, they have the power to do anything that you can do financially. Um, and then and you would need to have a backup for that as well so that you're planning long term. Yeah, and as an example, so let's say my wife and, and I, let's say, you know, we own joint assets. We also have, you know, I have an IRA. She has an IRA, which is an individual retirement account. Her name can't be on mine. My name sure. can't be on hers. If I was traveling and unavailable and something urgent needed to be done with my IRA, Without a power of attorney, she would not be able to do it for me. That's correct. Right? She would not have the legal authority to sign a document or do something for you. She would on a joint asset. That's right. But not but not on my asset. In your name alone, any of those assets she would So I would have to have a power of attorney. That's correct. Yeah. And likewise, if someone's older, let's say they're in their late seventies or eighties. And you know, they're in those times that they have to take a required minimum distribution from their IRA. If they are getting later into the year and all of a sudden they're temporarily incapacitated and they haven't taken their RMD, they're going to be kind of stuck because right, because the spouse will not be able to do that for them. That's correct. That's right. So I just want people to understand the essential, you know, how important that is. It is very important. And it may not be used for two or three years after someone signs it, but when it's needed, you're so grateful that you have it. Um, Yeah. So the will, the financial power of attorney. And then the third document would be a healthcare power of attorney, which to me is the most important document because if you aren't able to tell the doctors what to do, they need someone who can instruct them what to do. Um, and some people think, well, my spouse is automatically included, but, and and candidly, some doctors in this area, that is the way they operate, but technically legally, they're not allowed to take instructions even from a spouse, um, or child. So you need to have someone specifically named who has that legal authority to act on your behalf. If you can't tell the doctors what to do. As long as you're able to do it, you're in control. But if you can't, you need someone who has that authority. It could be a life or death situation. Um, yeah, I mean, what if even on an adult child, like let's say you're you're an adult, you're married, um, you're in a critical health issue. What if your spouse and your mom disagree on treatment? Right. I guess Terry Schiavo back in the day, you know, that was a name that none of us would ever know if she had done a medical power of attorney. That's exactly right. right? Because the husband got in a fight with the, with the mother. That's right. Yes. And they couldn't agree on how her treatment would be. And there was nothing in writing to get Whereas her if it wishes. had been in writing and if she had designated her husband, it had been clean. It would have. That's right. Yeah. And then the fourth document. The fourth one is related to that. And that's a living will. Um, which is also sometimes just called an advanced directive. Um, And so don't confuse that will with a a living will. A living will is basically just saying, I do or don't want artificial life support. Um, It specifies your wishes regarding a feeding tube. 
And very importantly, you can specify some some conditions or values that you wish that if you if you don't have that quality of life, that you say, I do or don't want these particular medical procedures. So that's that's instructions to your physician um, as well as to your family. If uh, what if you don't ha- what if you, if I have a medical power of attorney but do not have a living will, am I am I covered where my power of attorney can do those decisions? Essentially, your power of attorney has given them the power, the ability to make those decisions. So the living will though is definitely important so that your wishes are on in on paper and they can look at what you want. What if what if my wishes say and I like to refer to the living will. I like to call it death with dignity. Sure. That's good. that document. You're you're incapacitated, you have no hope for recovery. What methods do you want used to keep you alive? That's right. Um what if my living will says don't feed me and my power of attorney tells the hospital staff you need to put a feeding tube in. Yeah, now that's a difficult one. And because <laughs> legally in Tennessee, doesn't don't I have a right to to put those wishes in a living will? You sure do. You have a right to do that, and it kind of comes to the hospitals, in you know each individual hospital's policy. What do we do in that situation? And they may even even get like a medical ethicist to come in and give them an opinion mm-hmm. on what should be done. And I guess there we we live in such a litigious society. Yes. They don't want to be sued. That's right. That is their big concern is that the person who they're concerned about both in that context where there's a conflict between what they're being told by the agent that's been nominated and the document, the agent could sue them for not doing it, but the person could, could, could survive and sue them for doing it. (laughs) So it's, it's really a, a dilemma. Yeah, I know, uh, you know, I think people as they age, they like to put like my wife, for example, she doesn't have a living will Mm -hmm. and I do Mm -hmm. now she's my power of attorney. I'm her power of attorney for healthcare. And one of the reasons we've witnessed and experienced miracles. Yes. You know, I mean, we're in our early fifties and 12, you know, in our late thirties, we were in a, in a car behind, we'd just eaten dinner with some dear friends and the lady we were we we'd been eating with, she and her husband were in different cars. A, a drunk driver ran the red light, smashed into her. For some reason, she did not have her seatbelt on. Yeah. And she was unconscious. She had a horrible head injury, and she was. My good friend was told, she 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 can't. She'll be a vegetable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, she woke up. Yeah. And is living an independent life today. Right. And so you know, my wife was like. We believe God's still in the miracle business. Sure. And so she wants me to make those decisions in consultation with her mother. Okay. Now, for me, I decided to go ahead and just put in writing what I would do- want done and not done. Mm-hmm. But are these common types of things you get people asking you about? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it's very common. And and it's an important conversation to have. It's a hard conversation to have because you don't like to talk about morbid things or, or medical things. Um, but it's also important to it's not just you can have a a living will and that just states very clinical types of things you can also do one that is very values based like you were saying i believe that miracles still happen and you can then specify that i want to leave room for that i don't want to be uh you know immediately just just give up on me um and other people are like i don't want to I don't want to be kept on life support for even one day because I just don't want that. Um, I don't like the idea of it or I don't want the money spent. So it really is good to, to articulate values and that way your family and your physician know what your values are. Um, and they're not just listening to the person who's saying do this or don't do this, or it doesn't make sense to me to do this. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an important part of living will. We're visiting with local attorney Stephen Carpenter, and we're talking about legal documents, wills, powers of attorney, and estate plan. When we come back, we're going to talk about common mistakes people make with their legal documents and as we visit with Stephen Carpenter. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI.
Back to more living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. Hope you're having a very blessed Christmas season. Uh, Getting planned for the new year is a big part of what we think about in December. We're talking about estate planning, legal documents, where do people make mistakes, very, very important issues as you plan for the future. We're visiting with local attorney Stephen Carpenter, who has been a longtime friend of the show. Stephen, um, w- one thing that I hear, I, I talk to some people, and they just keep delaying getting their wills done, mm-hmm. their legal documents. And I think part of that is they just maybe, maybe because it's morbid, but maybe because they feel like things are caught, like, once I do this, I can't, you know, change it. Right. What do you see and what do you recommend to people who keep delaying it? Do you think that's the number one reason? What other reasons do you see and what what can we do to get people to take action? Yeah, you know, a, a lot of people do have this sense that, well, sometimes it's just, it's this is complicated, this is hard to do, I don't want to tackle it, I'll just put it off. Um, so just general procrastination is often the case and they don't realize they can come in to see whoever their lawyer is, sit down and the, the, they do the documents, and then they come back and make sure it's right. So it's easier than a lot of people think. Um, and so just putting it off because it seems like a daunting task uh, is a common thing. But, yes, I've had clients who've actually told me that they put it off because it seemed too final. Or, or even that if I have a will, it may hasten my death. Just something that's, that's almost unreasonable but that's in the back of their mind that was they realized that that's what was keeping me from doing this um so yes there are lots of lots of reasons people delay um and i think too sometimes people just they're not sure how they want they're not sure about the decisions that's right so there's a lack of clarity or they're uncertain about the decisions or maybe don't 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 maybe you know not sure what they're they might miss Yes, or they're even trying to avoid uncomfortable conversations with family members about these issues. Mm. I see that often that it's just easier to do nothing, it seems, than to tackle what are we going to do about this that everybody in the family knows is an issue. Maybe it's a family member or maybe one of the children is on drugs and you know they're just hoping that that changes so that they don't have to have you know a continuing trust or something to hold them funds so we've talked about some of the problems with not having a medical power of attorney or a financial power of attorney what happens if you own something and you die and you do not have a will okay in that context it's called intestacy which is just a fancy legal word that means you died without a will and tennessee actually has a statute that specifies who gets your asset, whether it's just the one asset or everything you have. Um, and it is based on the relationship of the person. Um, and it's often not what you would assume. So someone, a, a married couple and the husband has a, a checking account or a CD in his name alone. It's not. And if they have children, it won't go entirely to the wife. It will be split. Like, you know, if they have two children, the wife will get a third and each of the two children will get a third. So, you know, the assumption that it would be going to your, your surviving spouse is just not valid because that's not what the statute says. Yeah. uh, Wow. I never knew that. That's, Mm -hmm. that's very informative. I think that the big thing to me is even regardless of what the statute says, the state of Tennessee is now in control. Yes, that's right. And not me. That's right. They whereas whereas I put the document in place, I've controlled it. Now then I'm controlling it posthumously. That's right. Right after I've passed away. But still, I'm the one controlling that. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. And that's right. what we want to do with the stuff we own. That's right. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a will. If it's a bank account or a brokerage account, then you can name a beneficiary of that account. And you're still in control of who you can, you know, you can leave it separate and yet name who you want to receive it. Um, but a will certainly is, is a good way to do that. Um, but that's one of the things that I see a mistake often that people fail to look at, you know, how are their accounts titled, what, whose name it is, and then are their beneficiaries named and are those beneficiaries still who they intend? 
Um, you'd be surprised how many people still have an ex-spouse on a beneficiary designation, and that can create a big mess. Yeah, by law, that is, that beneficiary designation supersedes the will, yeah. and people don't understand that. I know there was a case, I don't know, Stephen, it's probably been 10 years ago, you might remember this, but a, 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 a case went to the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. a, a lady a husband and wife had divorced, and they had adult an adult yes. daughter. Yes. They had divorced. They split the assets, did new legal documents. Well, the father died, and he had redone all his legal documents to leave everything to his daughter, but he never changed his beneficiary designation, and it was to his ex-wife. Yes. And so his daughter sued her mother. Ah, yes. And it went to the Supreme Court, and it was like eight to nothing. Mm-hmm. Beneficiary rule rules that's right yeah that's right and, and we're going to come back around to beneficiary designations because i do think that's very very overlooked and how that all works but before i leave the wheels and things like that what do you, what are the most common mistakes that you see people make in general with their with their legal documents their estate planning one of the mistakes i see is that people just don't revisit it often enough so they have a very outdated estate plan. They have a will in place and they have powers of attorney, but some of the people in there have de- are now deceased or you know they it, it's just it's just too out of date. Maybe even tax provisions have changed. So that's number 1. Um and I don't want to sound self-serving as a lawyer, but another mistake people make is not seeking professional guidance uh in doing them. So sometimes I see someone has handwritten out their own will and it has too many flaws in it, and it creates more problems by not seeking the guidance of a professional than had they just not even had one at all. So on updating your documents, how often should people be looking at that? Do you have a rule of thumb? Yeah, every three to five years is a good rule of thumb. Um, the tax laws change. Other laws change. It's not just tax-related. Um, and family situations, people you know, pass away or you have a a new family member, a grandchild's born or something. Yeah. I would probably add, in addition to the saying, you're saying three to five years, if you have a major life event in your family, which I would, Mm -hmm. a marriage, divorce, a birth or a death. That's exactly right. Yes. Then you probably need to get them out and look at them. Now you mentioned changing laws and changing tax statutes. Mm -hmm. So like even in today's world, even if your will is only four years old, since you've done your documents, there have been two acts of Congress that changed how retirement account distributions are handled. That's exactly right. right. With the Secure Act and the Secure Act 2.0, it doesn't necessarily mean somebody needs to update their plan, but they may need to, right? That's right. That's exactly right. You've got to keep on top, on top of those things um, because what you thought was going to happen may have been changed by these laws. Yeah, especially for someone who thought they were stretching or retirement for their child in their IRA and suddenly that's now they can't do it and if they were leaving it to trust for their child it really becomes complicated with the new law that's right so just an example of how statutes and laws and tax codes can change and that's why I agree with Stephen and of course he's in the business I'm not an attorney but um, but I do see people just don't update them frequently enough Um, now you mentioned people do it on their own they might do a handwritten will. How, how many, a lot of people do ask me if there's a good online tool or a software that can kind of plug and play their legal documents. What would you say to that? You know, uh, using an online tool or a yeah. software. Yeah, there are some out there right now that are adequate. Um, I, I probably couldn't have said that 10 years ago. Um, but there are, you know, if, if someone wants to do it there on their own, they definitely should go to one of those, you know, they want to find something that's more of a reputable um, website. Um, but if their situation's kind of simple, not real complicated. Mm-hmm. That's right. It could sometimes work. It can sometimes work. The only problem that I see with those, the documents generally are fine, you know, with its a legal zoom or one of these websites. Um, but the problem is they may ask questions and the person doesn't understand what their yeah. response is, and they put in something that doesn't make sense or that 
even contradictory information within the documents. So they don't fully understand the question. That's right. What about power of attorney documents? I mean, typically the the self-help tools I've seen have not been very good, but I honestly haven't looked at it in a few years. Right. Um, They are improving for sure. Um, And there are competing companies out there, you know, so there are several others available. Um, And, and there's also for like we were talking about the healthcare power of attorney, there is a free form that the state provides. Um, It's kind of bare bones information and it is definitely only, you know, very clinical in in its approach. Um, But that's available for, for absolutely free. Um, and there are some websites, um, I know that uh, actually some churches are promoting and charities a uh, free website um, that is, uh, I haven't looked at, but um, it's that's attractive to people. And certainly if someone doesn't have the means to do, uh, you know, an estate plan with an attorney, they're far better off to do something like that than to just not have anything at all. Um, and maybe then have someone who does know something about it take a look at what they've done. Absolutely. We're visiting with Stephen Carpenter, local attorney, this morning. We're talking about estate planning, legal documents. When we come back, let's talk about probate. How bad is probate? What are steps to avoid probate? Should you take those steps? What does that really look like? So stay with us as we visit with Stephen Carpenter here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thanks for tuning in this morning to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and uh, we're, you, can, you can catch us every week, 9 to 10 a.m., and again, 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, and then we'll have this show podcast on our website and on Apple Podcast and Spotify uh, we'll have them up by Tuesday afternoon. So you can podcast all of our shows. You can download them. You can also stream it directly from my site at broganfinancial.com and click on radio. We're visiting this morning with Stephen Carpenter. It's just a great time of the year to talk about our planning moving forward, especially our legal planning and our estate planning. And we're talking about legal documents. Let's talk about probate, Stephen. Does sure. probate gets a bad name? What's probate like in Tennessee? Well, actually, probate is not terrible here. Um, there are some states that it's it's a big process and it's harder, um, but in Tennessee, it's not terribly bad. Um, but it is something that a lot of people want to avoid. It it is time consuming and a hassle for the for the person you've named as the executor of your will. Um, and if if someone does hire an attorney, it can be expensive as well. Um, so there are reasons why people want to avoid probate, but essentially probate is, um, it's just the legal process through which someone who's deceased, their assets are distributed to the people that they've named in their will. Um, it also is a process to, um, to, to deal with creditors. So through that process, their debts and taxes get paid and the court oversees that whole process. And so you mentioned Tennessee, uh, well, I did, and then you mentioned other states, but there's some states you definitely don't want to go through probate, right? That's right. Florida, North Car- yeah. Florida has a probate tax. And, 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 and North Florida, Carolina has an assessment. They have, yes. Um, now, Florida is, is making great strides Are at, they? at getting that more like Tennessee. <laughs> really? So, yes. So I think... Um, yeah, because people in, in Florida, I mean, they pretty much, if you own a house, it's going to be in a trust. Yes. To avoid probate, which it kind of leads me to my next thing. Uh, Before we get into the trust stuff, what goes through probate? You mentioned the will, and probate is actually a process of proving the will and administering your will. Yes. Um, So what what assets, most and more importantly, do not go through probate? Okay. Anything that has a beneficiary designation bypasses probate by operation of law through that beneficiary designation. Um, anything that is joint with rights of survivorship goes to the person who's joint on the account. Um, so assets though, that are in your name alone, one individual's name 
by definition, has to go through probate if those other conditions. If they don't have a beneficiary. That's right. And in Tennessee, I cannot name a beneficiary on real estate. On a deed, that's right. On property. That's right. Now, there are some states that have that, and eventually we may have that. Um, But right now, we do not have the ability to name a beneficiary on a deed. There aren't many that do, are there? Uh, Aren't there it's just incre- two or three, or well, is it more than that? It's more than that now. A, a, quite a few states. It used to huh. be, you know, just one or two, and now several states have added that on. And because Tennessee's usually been pretty upfront and center on yes, friendly to state planning rules. We have been, and we have updated our statutes. We were kind of behind the, you know, on other states, and we have some of the best trust laws in of of all fifty states now. Um, but that's one of the things that, for whatever reason, the legislature has not passed, and it it's it would be pretty simple to do, um, but you know, for now we've got to deal with what we have. So then, how does somebody for their real property in Tennessee? How do they avoid probate? Um, okay, so there's the the direct way where they avoid probate through a life estate, which I do not recommend. Um, and then there is creating a trust that holds title to the real estate. And now the person they've named a successor trustee simply steps in their shoes and can sell it without having to go through probate. Talk about a life estate. Okay. A life estate essentially is where you have deeded property to someone else. They now own it, but you have reserved for yourself the ability to live in that house or property, whatever it might be, for your lifetime. And then as soon as you die, your rights go away. It's It remains theirs. There's a lot of implications to that. There are. There are tax implications. There are tax implications, mm-hmm. right. That's right. There are control and control. Like lawsuits. What, lawsuits. So mm-hmm. you're not, what, what if you're, you do that with your child and your child's in a car accident and gets sued, mm-hmm. you could have a real problem. That's right. Or, or your child is in a divorce, and that's one of their assets. Um, it, it's it, you have a real problem with that. So I don't recommend doing that. But it is it is fairly it's commonly an option. done. Yeah. But then you have to be sure you're filing gift forms and tax forms and all that. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot. Of- well, I think what a lot of people don't realize is one key benefit people give up when they gift any kind of asset, an investment, a property, a house to their kids. It's the step up in tax basis mm-hmm. death. That's right. So if I've got, let's say I've got a stock that I paid $50,000 for and it's worth 300000 Well, when I die, if it's in my name, there is a step up, a forgiveness, a step up in the tax basis from 50000 to three hundred. So in other words, I don't have to pay the capital gains tax. Right. Or the child doesn't that inherits it or the spouse that inherits that, that, it. That's right, because right, I've passed away. That's right. <laughs> but if... Um, if I gift it to my child, mm-hmm. they don't get that benefit. They do not. That's correct. They they keep the fifty thousand dollar basis in that example, and they sell it, and they have capital gains tax. Whereas if they had inherited it instead, no capital gains tax. Yeah, under Big current difference. law. That's right, under current law. Um, and I don't. I don't maybe we won't go down that road. what's congress gonna do yeah um we're visiting with stephen carpenter this morning we're talking about very important issues with estate planning um when we come back i want to talk about your digital footprint this is becoming more and more important what happens to your digital footprint those are digital assets do you have a plan for your digital footprint when you pass away so stay with us this is more living with jim brogan on news talk 98.7 woki this is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI as we're visiting with Stephen Carpenter and we're talking about some year-end planning, getting our legal ducks in a row, estate planning, which is getting our legal ducks in a row. You don't have to have a multi-million dollar estate to do estate planning. If you own something and you love somebody, you need an estate plan. And we're talking about all those things that go into that in key overlooked areas with local attorney Stephen Carpenter. Um, let's talk, Stephen, about our digital footprint. Sure. I mean, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We've got our emails. What about our? We got all these passwords. 
We've heard stories of people that nobody knows the password even to get into the phone, and the phone has all that key data and information in it. Exactly. So how should we be managing our digital assets and our digital footprint in our estate plan? Yeah, that's increasingly important, and and I've even seen situations where you, you've probably seen it uh, you know, on the news and what have you, where someone has a crypto account and they can't get to it. Their, their family doesn't know the password or the, the encryption key or something. Um, so we do need to be uh, focused on that. That's just one of the trends that we see that we need to follow and to update estate planning to include those things. So how do we do that? Do we okay. put that in our documents? Is it about storing information in the right place? Yeah, Jim, it's actually both. So there's a way to put things in the document to give certain authority to, to your agent and hmm. to your executor. But a lot of it is done through those platforms. So, you know, if it's a Facebook account you mentioned, they have a legacy contact that you can set up. You have to go into your account, click through some, some you know, various levels, and then you find it. And you name that person, and then they have the authority uh, to access your account after you've passed. So really anything we're active on... That's right. We everything. should be going in to look at naming those people on those platforms. That's right. Each one has a different way to do it. You know, Instagram is different. And, you know, so you have to go through and it takes a little bit of time. It would be nice if there were a uniform way to do it, but there, there isn't cur- currently. Um, but it is very important. I'm, I'm sure you have gotten birthday reminders uh, on, online of someone that you know is deceased. And the reason mm-hmm. for that is because their family had no way of Turn, turning off their account or just making it dormant um, because they didn't have that legacy contact or anything of that nature. Wow, that's extremely um, – because we really don't – I mean, especially as we th- those of us that are 50 and up, I think – we don't really think about that much. That's right. Of what would happen to those things when we pass away. When my sister passed away unexpectedly, I guess, six, five years ago, um, we couldn't get it. Nobody could get into her phone, and it had contacts, passwords, and it created – I ended up being the executor, mm-hmm. and it created a lot of headaches because I had to do so much more work because I could not get in her phone. Exactly. Um, and some people have a different person who is their digital executor. So they have mm-hmm. someone that they name as their executor to, to – to deal with assets, but maybe a younger family member who's into the digital and that's the person they've designated for that. But I recently had an estate where the uh, single lady died and you know, her phone and her computer were right there, but no one knew how to get into it. And, and she was a professional. She, you know, she, she knew she should have done all this. Um, and we just happened to hack into the password by multiple guesses. Which can be dangerous doing that because it can lock the thing up mm-hmm. if we're wrong. Um, I'm a big believer, as you know, Stephen, I'm a big believer in having a written inventory of everything mm-hmm. yes. that your executor could follow. Um, talk about the importance of that, of having things written down in a safe and secure place that your loved ones can get to. Yes. So if if you've done that, It makes it so easy because they now have a roadmap. Here are all the accounts. Here are all the passwords. And it doesn't have to be necessarily written. There are apps that you can have, you know, just a single password that that person knows and then all of these various ones that you change frequently because ideally you should be changing your passwords every little bit, every month maybe. Um, And so... You know, the it becomes cumbersome to have the written inventory, but sure. but you need. I think everyone should do that and then periodically update it. But it's so nice to have these online systems or something. Sometimes clients just have a spreadsheet, and they keep that, and then someone knows how to get into the spreadsheet. Um, but if you do it online, you can print that out periodically, and you still have the paper that you put with your estate planning documents in a fireproof safe, so that and someone knows how to get into that safe. Um, so I also am a big believer in taking inventory of all the assets and who's your professionals in your life. Uh, we have at Brogan Financial, we've produced a guide years ago called a vital records worksheet. And what it does is help you take inventory of all your assets and who your professionals are, who's your insurance with, who's your insurance agent, what's their phone number. It's little things like that. Where do you keep everything? What are your accounts? Uh, you can get a copy of that 
guide, that vital records worksheet, if you go to BroganFinancial.com and click on resources, you can scroll down and you can download. It's a complimentary download. Go to BroganFinancial.com and click on resources, and it's called our vital records worksheet. And I think keeping an inventory is so critically important. Um, It's very helpful. Absolutely. Um, If somebody's charitably inclined, Stephen, um, how how should they incorporate that into their estate plan? Okay, one of the wonderful things I think that, that can be done is uh, if someone has an IRA 401k, um, they can do the qualified uh, beneficiary, uh, the, the designation so that the charity would receive the distributions. Um, and, of course, the charity doesn't pay income tax on it. So that is, I'm sure you make the QCD recommendation yeah qualified charitable distribution so if you're in if you're at the age where you have to take minimum distributions from your retirement accounts 73 and older i mean any charitable giving you're doing should be coming from your ira because it literally comes straight off your taxable rmd Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's right so and it's and it's a win-win because the charity doesn't have to pay the tax on it so right um we've now somebody's charitably inclined at at death Mm -hmm. I would still say it's probably best to start with the retirement account assets because they haven't been taxed, mm-hmm. to, and my kids are going to have to pay the tax on those assets, whereas if I own stock or a house because of that step up in tax basis, they don't have to pay tax on those assets. That's right. So I'd rather leave the charity, the IRA, or part of the IRA, mm-hmm. right? That's right. Absolutely. But, but that can create some complication with beneficiary designations. It can, um, and especially if you know, there, there are scenarios where – you want you don't want a charity involved in your beneficiary designation, or perhaps you want to have a you have a child who is on drugs or something, and you want a trust to receive those funds for their benefit. You don't want a charity mixed in there in certain you know because yeah, and a trust is not a living person. Right. Or excuse me, a charity is not a living person. That's right. And so, if a charity is included in the beneficiary class it can sometimes cause tax issues for the other beneficiaries. That's exactly right. That's that's where I'm going with that. Yep. So and so just needs careful planning. It does. It does. Yeah. I, I would probably be a fan of just splitting off a, a partial, taking part of the IRA. You want to go to charity or church, mm-hmm. split it off, have it be its own IRA, right. and leave it 100% to the church or charity. And then that way the, the IRAs that are going to your kids, your family, your loved ones only go to people because yes. it always gets more complicated and more tax ramifications if there's beneficiaries that are not people. That's right. That's right. Another thing, if someone's charitably inclined, is a donor advised fund. So, for people who are particularly, um, you know, they want to actually be proactive and set that up. Um, so, that's something to also consider. Uh, yeah, donor advised funds. You can control the the fund until you designate the the charity to get paid, but you get the deduction when the money goes into the donor advised fund. Mm-hmm. Stephen, I hate we're out of time. How yes. can people get in touch with you? Okay, so I am an attorney with the law firm of Carpenter and Lewis. Um, we are on Kingston Pike uh, in West Knoxville. Um, they can reach us um, by calling uh, 865-690-4997. And website? It is www.carpenterlewis.com and that Lewis is L-E-W-I-S. Carpenter okay, CarpenterLewis.com, L-E-W-I-S. Mm-hmm. Stephen, thanks so much for taking time out sure, of your busy pleasure. schedule. Always fascinating to talk about. Uh, thank you for tuning in this week. Have a very blessed weekend. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.